Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, to chair this session, but I will also start this session by a short presentation. Uh, my presentation is a grand spread, a big question mark. Uh, let me start from the from the obvious and then a bit uh, sophisticating my presentation. The obvious is that uh, what we see around that is that structure of IR is changing in the ways that it's creating a sense of instability with governability and unpredictability. And uh, the idea of this workshop uh, came from the constatation that even the strongest states uh, are losing control over design change. And no small part in that story plays geopolitical and geoeconomic tensions between the so-called Global South and Global North. Or as Susan Peters labeled it, the West versus the rest. Or as Richard Sakva put it, political South versus political West. But not it's w notwithstanding terminology, the fact that many states in Latin America, Africa, and some parts of Asia and Middle East, I counted roughly, them uh, up to 35 to 40 of them, including China, India, Iran, Malaysia, Brazil, and the list goes on. Increasing view the rule-based order as a little more than the positive spin for an array of hegemonic policies, including the embargo-style sanctions and unwarranted military interventions that have underpinned Western primacy. So in uh, my first point is that in the span of a few decades, the relationship between South and North move along certain very clearly marked phases, from subordination to mix of cooperation and subordination, then to competition currently, and finally, in the case of the few, to a selective confrontation. So we have a steady increase of tensions. In, what the, in other words, it might be the beginning of the grand split between North and South. It is the beginning, in my sense, of the global power relocation, or if you wish, a location of global hierarchy that is pushing and adjusting globalization towards global regionalization. And usually in this process, first comes conceptualization of the split and then, uh, and then followed by the institutionalization of dissent. And uh, you can measure this institu institutionalization of dissent by watching the newly formed international organization, regional organizations such as BRICS, STCO, BRI, and global financial institutions that are located in the South, such as New Development Bank or IIB and few others in the, in the regions. Such developments, if sustained, again, if sustained, have a capacity to efficiently support and refuel hegemonic regional aspirations, along Peter Katzenstein uh, a book from uh, 2010. Uh, those processes, important as they are, not are not convincing enough, however, to proceed with the announcement of the Grand Split. I published the, a paper on the Grand Split, which uh, two, year, two and a half years ago, and uh, it was a radical paper. The split is here, the division is visible, you cannot do nothing about this, let's watch what will happen where a next war will, will erupt. <laughs> Since then, I toned my, uh, after digging into research, I toned my position very significantly. And I'm not sure whether the grand split is, is already there. <laughs> and I don't know yet how deep is the process. It's, this is the current research that I am doing. But uh, let's go through the certain evidence to, uh, to measure the depth of the split uh, and test this. And there are a couple of ways to measure the split. 
the depth of the split and sustainability of the split. One is Beverly Silver from Job Hopkins approach or proposal to find the key structural contradictions in the international political economy, such as uh, wealth versus inequality, poverty versus politics, development versus biosphere, and so on and so forth, and test whether either current hegemon or its opponents were able to successfully meet global challenges. <coughs> There's a one way. Beverly tentative answer is that uh, most actors preferring reformist solution to the revolutionary challenges to lay foundation for a new expansion. <laughs> so her, her conclusion is, hold on, uh, the guys are very hard on rhetoric, on action, they are much uh, more sober. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, findings on numerous recent research on catching up processes in the economic sense and converges of the income gap between the West and the rest provides a provision answer that there is a fragile process of convergence between South and North, stronger in Southeast Asia as proposed by Justin E. Fulin, uh, regionally, regionally unevenly distributed in case of Latin America, as proposed by Jose Ocampo, prone to some backward movement in case of India, proposed by Jayati Ghosh and Prabhat Patnaik, and de or dependent on many factors beyond control, completely beyond control of Global South, as Jomo Sundaran from Malaysia suggested. This will suggest an uneven convergence rather than growing split or deeper divergence in, divergence in economic sense. So the counter argument here is that in the purely economic sense, there is more convergence than divergence, <laughs> you can observe. Third, another way to measure the depth and direction of the split is testing the hypothesis on the extent of global South remaking itself from norm, norm takers to norm breakers and recently norm makers. This is quite revolutionary, <laughs> I would say. The point is that in recent decades, countries of Global South are more confidently taking a new transformative role of norm makers. <laughs> so don't worry about the norm breakers. You should worry if you are in the ways of the new norm makers, because that is geared toward the future. <laughs> And most sophisticated studies in that key by amazingly under-researched area is coming from s so far from Singapore, Malaysia, and Australia, as they advance studies on international investment regimes, IIR, and its alternatives coming from Southeast Asia. Studies on standardization provisions as well as adjustment to standardization of FDIs for indirect investment with countries in Global South and bilateral investment treaties, BIT, so-called BITs. All it sounds very technical and boring, but, uh, <laughs> but in reality, we are talking about changing norms in regulating hundreds of billions of dollars yearly. It, they cover the uh, more trade than uh, these new arrangements, these new norms are regulating the arrangements for more trade than European Union altogether. <laughs> uh, and they prelimi the preliminary conclusion that I can draw from the studies suggests that while the Global South is generally still fitting to liberal economic order, we are at the beginning of, I am quoting one of the studies, alternative investment regime globally. <laughs> consistently limiting advantages of traditional capital exporting states. So this is the argument for, convert, for split, for divergence. Another important area of norm making capacity demonstrating in a shift from rule following to rule making is intellectual property rights. Also here the US uh, and again Singapore and Australia are leading the studies. And, the, and many of them are concluding that China is one of the main global players and the world champion in number of registered patents and has really transformative potential as a rule maker in key area of intellectual property regimes, so-called 
trade-related aspects of property rights, TRIPS, and IP protection. So, uh, but China is doing it very, very slowly. There is no drama in their approach. <laughs> they are doing this, which most of the researchers are underlining so through the so-called constructive inconsistencies. A very interesting Chinese way, constructive inconsistencies, which help them not to counter make a counter-proposal or real change, but rather bypass existing norms in in regulated way, in the predictable way. Uh, another fourth this time area of uh, analysis of the performance of the performative and discursive techniques are other areas of measuring the size of the rupture of the grand split. Uh, good example is here the uh, transformation area uh, in uh, and practices of sovereignty and national interests. I will not convince you, you know it better than, uh, than I, because you teach this every day, that the concept of sovereignty is foundational to modern politics. It's foundational in many ways, because it, uh, it provides the basic conceptual taxonomy of security, peace, peace hierarchy, quali quality of states, prohibition of intervention, and so on and so forth. And generally speaking, the behavior of states was historically determined by their relative power. But in the recent decade, we saw a transformation of the sovereignty as a right. Sovereignty as a right to protect your territory, people, and assets to sovereignty as capacity. This is a new approach, and this is pretty important for IR to study. <laughs> it, in a simple words, it means that the stronger you are, the more sovereignty you can carve out of your state. In turn, the independent state becomes more free from obligations in relation to other states. It also suggests that a few states nowadays have a capacity to be sovereign. This is the recent Chinese approach. There are a few states that have a privilege to be sovereign. No, sovereignty is not for everyone. <laughs> It assumes that if the states have a combination of military, economic, social, cultural, and ideological power, others do not have this. And for others, it means that either they will become dominated or subordinated by the rule of the stronger actors or choose the risky but not hopeless, as we see recently, way of going towards conflict with them. Sovereignty understood as capacity also means for leading states to be in different intensity free from many international norms and customs. First and most important, from the notion of equality of states before the law and in following international law. Russia, China comes to mind, obviously. Another example of grand split is causing a redefinition of the national interests. And there are two, at least two, in, two interlocked processes taking place. One is, can be termed as securitization of everything, as a reaction to growing multiple threats and instability, followed by weaponization of state and its policies, such as weaponization of information policies, migration policies, financial policies, and so, and so on and so forth. So the point is, here that from water, raw materials, energy, debt, medicine, I, A, AI, all aspects almost of social and market relations may become a matter of national security and thus are specifically protected from open access by others, mostly by multiple trade uh, barriers. Uh, critical minerals is a good example that are specifically being protected for the last three, four years. In UK, even they developed a special uh, UK Critical Minerals Intelligence Center <coughs> that is measuring the access of UK to such uh, critical minerals and keep them on the high security list. So uh, that is a good example. I am going to uh, give you one more and 
and and uh, round up this presentation by. Uh, but before I will conclude, it's one more example of the discursive of the discursive techniques and introduction of the civilizational paradigm into the IR. <laughs> Uh, many states in the South uh, argues that norm-based international order I is for them culturally alien and not meeting the interests, spiritual needs and power aspirations. So uh, as we uh, edited a book with uh, Elena Chebankova on the civilizational and international relations and and Laura is stopping me from blah blahing further. <laughs> uh, uh, it's it's time for for the conclusion. But I would like to uh, to say that important element of the IR in this discursive discursive component of the split is the having a sense of the national imaginarium. That is what many states in the South are now doing. A national, creating national repositories of images on how do we see the world ourselves and others. National repository <laughs> of images of friends and enemies. Uh, in conclusion, uh, what we know that the split is coming. <laughs> what we know that this is inconsistent. What you know that there are areas uh, like uh, investments and the trade regulation that are more advanced in the sense of splitting from the uh, Western norms than, uh, than others. But generally speaking, speaking, we don't know still uh, more than we know. We don't know what is the role of the mitigating factors, such as the inter-elite alliances between South and North. Uh, what is the, the speed and depth of further disintegration of the current international system, and so on and so forth. My advice would be, for the, uh, for the West, my advice we, will be that to continue domination, political West must prove that it can still guarantee collective security and provide a sense of stability and well-being. Otherwise, we will be losing for the people from the South. My advice would be uh, that uh, they have to mobilize more resources to meaningfully respond to the, to the fundamental question whether or not they have uh, viable ideas how to positively change uh, and uh, how to react to global challenges, which is not yet coming. And this unknowns will be probably the, uh, the purpose of the next collective book. Thank you very much for attention.